as I said, just a little bit of an introduction. Um, we do behavior in the workplace, and why does one care? The applications are immense. And so what I, my objective today, when I put together this little slide presentation, I had was the first time I ever did it because it had to be with a dark background. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to be able to do was to change your view of the world when I'm done, uh, as it relates to behavior, which is huge. So behavior in the workplace, all different th types of things happen. And I added at the end of it, because I put some humor in the end, the impact of behavior in the workplace and at home. And it really ties into what you do too, because you look at this piece, I think, with people. Okay, I'm going to get good at this. Okay, this is my right, face. Right there. <laughs> I'm just going to stay here. My finger glued to one spot. Your behavior is a recurring pattern of thought, feeling, and action that is productively applied. Okay, this is good. Yes. Nothing's happening here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I don't know why. <laughs> what am I wanting to hit here? There's a bar there. Uh, it's. Except you just have to. So, what do you do out here? That's much easier. So, for example, if you're instinctively inquisitive, that is a talent. That is part of your behavior. If you're competitive, that is a talent. If you're charming, that's a talent. If you're persistent, that's a talent. If you're responsible, that is a talent. If you're obstinate, that is a talent. It's one of your gifts. If you're nervous or a worrier, there are some of us that worry more than others, that is the talent. These characteristics are not skills or knowledge, they are all behaviors. Okay. Sorry about that. We all have boundaries. Some of you love pressure, create pressure in your life, you procrastinate to create pressure because you work better under pressure. Others do not like pressure. They like a more predictable, more calm, more stable, more steady environment to work in. Some of you strive for significance, while others live comfortably in the crowd. Neither is good or bad or right or wrong, but it's how we're hardwired behaviorally. Some of you revel in confrontation, while others yearn for harmony. Their confrontation is not effective. Two people, and I have a slide on this too, two, two people that revel in confrontation, it looks like they're having an argument and they call it a good debate. Mm -hmm. Perspective. Some of you worry about stuff, others simply don't worry. Consequences is not a word in their vocabulary. All of these things, behavior is a science, and they're all measurable of where you fit in the spectrum of these characteristics. The importance of behavior. This is an interesting fact. First of all, we have our declarative knowledge. That's our intelligence and our cognitivity. Intelligence, of course, is IQ, and cognitivity is how fast we learn or solve problems. Um, that is knowing the concept and its technical details of problem solving. When we walk into an office, or go home, we now have our procedural knowledge as our behavior. That is being able to put those concepts and ideas or details into action. So it's not if we can do the job, it depends on our education, our background, our training, all of you have training and education, different things, it's how we'll go about doing it. It's one of the things that Karen, that we're gonna get into with um, you and Karen and Gretchen. I think that's her name, yeah, I lose track of that. It's not if we can do the job, it's how we will go about doing the job. You've all had jobs you've loved, and you've all had jobs you've hated, and I can look at your PI and tell you what you loved and what you hated. The most conservative studies today, and those of the, the big guru of this is a guy by the name of Daniel Goldman, who um, working with emotional intelligence, EQ. The most conservative studies today rank behavior twice as important as intelligence and expertise. We feel we can teach you this. You can learn this, regardless of what your education or training or background is in. Measured behavior tells us, interestingly, what drives and motivates you in the workplace. It tells us how you learn and how you approach your job. Huge in training, a classroom I have, uh, my classes are usually about this size and everybody learns a little bit differently. So it's a two-day workshop that I teach in behavior and you have to direct it differently. They don't do that in schools, it's kind of tough on kids. 
um, how you interact with other people or not. Some of us really like interacting with other people on a continual basis, day in and day out, and others really kind of like to be left alone. What type of environment you excel in? As I said before, fast paced, slow paced, people involved, not people, um, dotting I's and crossing T's, or don't give me all that detail work. You want to be in charge, or would you rather just be part of the team? Um, how to coach and mentor you, which is what you do, is coaching and mentoring people, growing people. How to reward you other than money. You can't just keep throwing money at something. There, you know, you, there's people out there doing jobs that you would say, you couldn't pay me a million dollars to do that, and someone's doing it, and they're doing it successfully and enjoying it. How do you effectively communicate with others? How we receive information is based on our behavior, where our sensitivities lie, so another line down here, but how we communicate with others, it's important to know, which is why we teach them in the workplace, how people receive you. Great leaders know themselves as well. Where do you get your self-confidence from? Some of us get it from within. Others get it from what other people think and being accepted. Others get it from a stable, calm, steady, predictable environment. And others get it from where's the book so I can write this down and repeat it back and study it so that I don't make any mistakes. What you bring to the team, other than skill and knowledge, we'd like diversity at every level in an organization, from the C-suite down to the entry levels, because our behavior determines not only how we learn, but it's how we work together as well. How you make decisions. Decision making is huge, whether you're an entry level employee or in the C-suite. We make decisions every day, all day long, when to get up, how to drive to work. It's not just decisions in the workplace. It's making decisions guiding our lives through the day. Um, how do you delegate? People don't realize that as you work your way up in an organization, the, the art of delegation comes from three different parts of our behavior because there's a different type of delegate. There's the delegating of responsibility to others. There's the delegation of authority, which is empowering other people. And then there's the delegation of stuff, which is very difficult for some people to do that are very detail-oriented. They'd rather do it themselves because then they know it be done right. Would that might be control? Sorry. Could be. <laughs> and, and what's interesting about that is there are different controlling factors in each one of the factors, which I'll answer those questions later, but um, it can be perceived as controlling, but it's not. It's being careful. Um, and where do your sensitivities lie? That's the biggest part of the workplace and working together as a team is what someone says to you is not necessarily and, and, and you're sensitive to it, they're clueless that they even touched on one of your sensitivities. So understanding our own sensitivities and then realizing that when someone talks to us, it's not about us, it's about them. It changes the way you look at the world. I like to say, my, my first line to anybody that tells me that's got a big challenge with somebody at work is they go through what all their challenges are and then when we're done with that conversation, I say, change your expectations. They're expecting someone to behave differently than they do. And why would you do that if it's not in their measurable behavior to alter them? The applications of behavior in the workplace, I'm going to do those and then we'll just then I have my little cartoons. Um, the first application is job design. Um, what are the day in and day out demands of the job? Does it need an agreeable, accommodating team player, or does it need an independent, self starting and assertive individual? Does it require interaction with others or effectively working alone? Is the job fast paced and constantly changing with tiny pressures, or is it more routine and predictable? Does the job require that the individual be attentive to details? Does it require long hours? These are all questions that we ask about a job, designing a job, of who we're going to put into that job. You've heard about putting square pegs and round holes and round pegs and square holes. Attracting candidates. A job posting will attract more appropriate candidates when behavioral adjectives are used in conjunction with education, skills, and expertise. For example, if you're looking for an outside salesperson, their characteristics or their behaviors um, would require resilience to rejection, assertiveness, a competitiveness, independence, self-starting, a good communicator, we're looking for a bookkeeper, the characteristics would be quite different. They need to be detail-oriented, patient, methodical, analytical, and careful. How long do you think that we would keep this individual in this job? Or conversely, what if we hire, what if we take this person and put them into this job? 
what are the odds that we're going to keep them for very long? The other part of that is we get into retention. Communication. Our measurable behavior determines whether we are authoritative or persuasive in our communication style. By that, we mean some of us are more telling in our communication style, while others of us are more selling in our communication style. And it's perceived differently by whoever you're talking to. It provides a window into how we think and organize our information. Two naturally authoritative, assertive individuals might be having what they consider a good debate. To the agreeable and accommodating individual, it's an argument. And to this agreeable, accommodating individual, this is uncomfortable. It happens all the time in staff meetings. You know, two people go round and round. I, I have had people that have hated that Monday morning staff meeting to the point where the Sunday, their Sunday is completely miserable because they have to go. And it's confrontational, and they're, they're not comfortable. And I will say, another thing that is measurable with behavior is morale of an individual. And oddly enough, people talk about, gee, in an organization where there's high morale, you have engagement and productivity. And in an environment where there's uh, low morale, you have lack of engagement and productivity, and that's where you have turnover. And interestingly, we found over time in studies that it's all related to behavior and communication. When there's open and positive communication in a group, um, you have environments of high and good morale. And when there's lack of communication or negative communication, people don't know, you have home morales. So communication is a big cement thing within an organization for people to understand and be willing to participate in. Coaching. In order to effectively coach an individual, one needs to know their behavior and motivating needs, not necessarily their skills or education or expertise. Where are they now and where do they want to be? How do I most effectively communicate with them? How do I earn their trust? How do I effectively manage and lead them? Which is what you've learned to do in life coaching. Is that's the biggest thing you do. Earn their trust first. Performance management. Everybody likes feedback in their work day. What kind of a job am I doing? Am I contributing? Defining clear expectations for job performance. Identifying areas where the individual does not meet expectations as well as where they are, are meeting expectations and certainly even more exceeding expectations. Coach, communicate, and give feedback in ways that provide the support the individual needs to be successful. Set reasonable expectations. So we coach every day in the world of management in, uh, as we interact with uh, each other, not only to people that might report to us or to our peers, but certainly it's the same thing when we report to the people that we work for. Succession planning requires an inventory of the current team and the future needs of an organization. I've done a ton of succession planning in organizations. Who is our current CEO? Who's the VP? Who's, where are the directors? And where are we going to get our next level of people from? Large organizations, it's huge. I had a, a, a contract with uh, General Dynamics, and they had no succession plan. And when their VP of uh, Finance and the VP of um, uh, IT retired, it was a free-for-all of who was going to be in charge of anything. And this is a huge company. This is General Dynamics. Um, it's identifying individuals that will be naturally motivated by the day-in and day-out demands of the job. Discuss career goals with individuals in the organization. Knowing your behavior, your measurable behavior, puts you in charge of your own personal development. You know, we go into a company and, and, and we're, we're climbing a ladder, or maybe we're just happy where we're at. But be careful what you wish for, because all of a sudden you may find yourself in a job that is no longer fun. They call it, in the olden days, the Drucker days, they call it um, reaching your uh, level of incompetence. And I don't really believe that's true. I think what you do is you reach your level of what you will tolerate behaviorally. What drives and motivates you in a day and are your motivating needs being satisfied? When they're not, it's not fun. Peter Principal. Peter Principal. Peter Drucker. Um, clearly defined fits and gaps of individuals and the job requirements. <coughs> Oops. How do you go back? <clears throat> Creating Down the bottom. Down the bottom where there's an arrow? Well, it's a conflict resolution. It was just one more line, but it, you kind of got adjusted it. Conflict resolution. This is the biggest thing in organizations that I run into with people after I've 
gone through training and they know I exist. I get phone calls all day long from people saying, could you look at so-and-so's PI and, and talk to me? I'm, I'm having a real challenge with them. And it's solving those problems. And by the way, it's, there's never anybody at fault. Um, it's just that they don't see eye to eye or they rub each other the wrong way. And it's understanding that they're just differences in behaviors. And what we strive to do is take advantage of each other's differences rather than being antagonized by them. There are pills. We don't have we don't, pills, P-I-L-L-S, in a workplace. We don't have a solution for them. That's attitude. <laughs> conflict resolution. Identify the nature of the conflict and the desired outcome. This works hugely in, in an organization when you have two people that have had a conflict and, and whatever the outcome was resulted in disaster. So it's being able to go bring these two people together and say, okay, what went wrong and what was the outcome? What did we want the outcome to be? And having these two people solution to the outcome. It's amazing what changes in their perception of each other. Comparing the behaviors of the individuals in the conflict, and there's one factor, if you will, in the measurement of behavior where 96% of the conflict is in the workplace. And it's the people that are very careful versus the people that are very creative. Articulate the behaviors that are causing the conflict. Strategize about solutions to the outcome that created the conflict. So we're not talking about it's your fault or your fault. We're talking about the outcome of two behaviors. Determine resolutions for moving forward and avoiding future conflict. It solves a lot of problems in the workplace. Again, that's opening up the lines of communication. Communication that's positive and problem solving and moving forward creates environments of good and high morale. It all comes back around to that communication. Team building. We hear a lot about this. Um, what does each individual bring to the team? Because everybody has strengths and assets that they're bringing to the team. What are the differences and similarities in their communication styles? How they go about making decisions? I can tell you decision making can be a real conflict because you've got people that are readily making decisions and others going, wait, 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 just a minute here. And the perception of those two people is huge. Um, taking risk, which is making decisions, solving problems, taking action. That's the biggest thing. How many times have you got into a meeting and you met for 30 minutes and then you go out and you just go back to what you were doing? Is there any action we're going to take from, from, from having this meeting? It's one of the frustrating things there are. And it's connecting with one another. And once again, valuing our differences rather than being antagonized by our differences. I've worked with sports teams and it's, it's extraordinarily helpful. They're already skilled in what they do. What we're talking about is their behaviors and their interaction with one another as, as a team. Um, what are the team's strengths and the challenges? Being aware of those and building bridges to overcome those are huge. Retention and engagement. This is the biggest focus of my larger clients. Um, each individual needs to interact with their boss, their peers, and if in management, their direct reports. To gain their support, you must understand and motivate them. To understand and motivate people, you need to understand their behavior. What does motivate them? How do I communicate with them for them to stay? Oftentimes, we have what we would call high potential entering an organization, but if we don't recognize that and get them on that path, they won't stay there. So that's one of the big succession problems we have, is we don't have really dynamic decision-making people. They've left the company because they weren't challenged and they weren't given opportunity. Yes. <laughs> it takes so much energy to be what you are not, and it takes a little energy to be what you are. On the days you can go, when you go home and you are exhausted, you can look at your PI and you know why. Once you understand that, you can kind of move through those phases a little bit easier. It's a little bit easier to accept them. The days that, uh, if you're fast-paced and, and, and have a sense of urgency, the days that you were busy without a time to take a breath, you're energized when you go home. It's the same eight hours, and it's whether you used up all six of those D-cell batteries you walked out the morning with, or whether you recharged them all day long. And when we're in an environment where we get the opportunity to do what we do best in the way that we want to do it, we're energized. Be 
behavior at home because it goes there too. Behaviorally, You know, when you go to any kind of marriage counseling, family counseling, any kind of counseling between couples or co-workers or whatever it is between two people, they don't measure your IQ. They don't measure your cognitive ability. They'll use a disc or a Myers-Briggs or a, a tool out there that measures behavior because that's what drives you crazy. And by the way, opposites attract. The two-day class that I teach, which is an accredited class, um, I have people bring significant others behaviors, we, we do them ahead of time, because it turns into a little bit of marriage counseling. He does that. It drives me crazy. Change your expectations. He's going to do it tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. <laughs> it's true. And it could be, I love him, but I just picked these out of a couple little books. <laughs> Does anybody live there from time to time? <laughs> I'm married to one of those. <laughs> Not doing it to who irritate hasn't, you. Who hasn't been around a person like yes. that? Yes, <laughs> they're not doing. I promise you, they are not doing it to irritate you. Married to that, too. <laughs> yeah. That's how you came up with these, huh? Yeah, really. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody have any questions about behavior? About I don't know what my time is. Um, we have about five more minutes. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or, or any challenges that they've had in the workplace related to working with other people? Well, Marty, I have to say that you did my prediction along with my ex-partner, if you will, and, and the business that I was involved in. And uh, I really love what you said about changing expectations. I, I couldn't deal with it anymore, and I left because we were two diametrically opposed people. And she was that careful, analytical, and I'm the creative, you know, fly off the handle kind of thing. And instead of fighting the, the fight anymore, I just decided it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. Nothing wasn't wrong fun. with her. No. So we can't really insist that they take a predictive index <laughs> exam. Are there ways that we can uh, pick up more easily on the type of uh, behavior we're dealing with? There are. And as a matter of fact, another thing that we do is it's called customer-focused selling. 
and it's understanding. And I've got a quadrant that I can share with you um, that will help you. And I'd have to explain it to you. I couldn't do it in two minutes or even five. But yeah, there are ways to pick up on people, just how they present themselves, how they sit to tell whether they're, they want more detail, less detail. When you're talking with them, it's really being cognizant of who you're having the conversation with. Um, people that are outgoing and friendly and connecting kind of interrupt and chat. And, and then people that are thoughtful, sometimes you need to pause, give them time to think about it. It's a, kind of an investigation in the very beginning of a relationship that, that establishes the trust, the um, your expertise, their expertise. You both are coming together for a reason to share whatever you're doing. But it's not easy. Someone asked me if I worked with someone for a whole week, if I could draw their we have patterns of behavior, and I said no because there's when like she said controlling. There's different types of controlling. There's controlling to do things correctly, and then there's controlling to be in charge. Oh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I just want to acknowledge you for the work you do. You know, I think in the workplace, um, from my prior corporate life at Patty Pools, yeah. um, it was so important to really understand. Even though I, I, I used a different service, you know, yes. did connect and, and yeah. uh, but knowing who you're dealing with is really very valuable. And when you have an issue or had a concern, to be able to go back to it too. And then in you know my own issues of conflict, when I really started to pay attention to my own stuff. Instead of blaming and pointing fingers, it changed me. It, it did change. It does change you. Yeah. When you understand yourselves and yeah. what am I contributing to this conflict? Right. right. Then when I changed, my they changed, and so it wasn't that a miracle. Oh, it's just transformational too. And now, and you know, as a solopreneur, I am the chief cook and bottle washer. So you know, if I'm talking to my IT person, that's me, or my marketing person, or my sales person, or <laughs> my trainer, I'm all of them. So yes. it's a different relationship. Yeah. So, but I like my staff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just turns the hat in different directions. Right? <laughs> Talk to myself. Like you know? We are a small business, but we have 1.5 employees, and they are both 20 something young ladies. And so we, we oftentimes feel that it's just a generational thing mm -hmm. that they don't get what we're talking about. And we don't get what they're talking about. Um, it be just the most simple thing to ask them what motivates them? I, I try, but they just... A lot of people don't really even know. They've never, they, they've known, oh gee, I had a job here, and what I loved about that job was this little piece of it. Um, but um, I'm happy, I even brought some blank ones, I'm happy to run anybody's PI, I could demo it all day long. Um, as I said, my, my client is 50 or more employees, and, and they come in and take a two-day class, and then it embeds in there. But I sat down with them and kind of went over their PIs mm -hmm. one day yeah. over coffee, and uh, it just it, it explains, okay, that's why Dale does what she does, and that's why Mike does what he does. It's just a difference. Mm -hmm. But there is a big generational thing. It's a huge generational thing. We have some people who graduated from college and going to work mm -hmm. and being dissatisfied with the job and a parent calling. That's awful. I know it's awful, but it's true. But Susan, you can have your 1.5 employees take the PI. Yeah. It'll be nice for them to see. It's, it's fun for them to see. There's no such thing as a bad predictive index. Um, they're just different, and there are strengths in everybody's. And, you know, for an example, Sherry is the exact opposite of Karen, which is perfect. That's what Karen needs when you're talking about putting a team together. You know, she's the one that takes Karen and goes, come here. Because <laughs> Karen is, you know. I get that, but it's, it's really a struggle because the only people we can afford are these young people because we can't pay very much. And they're either good at one thing and not the other. We want them to be happy in that way. So yes. I'll take that one. Good. Okay. Be happy too. I just thought it was really interesting to smile during the whole presentation because we went through just this this morning in our office with mm -hmm. ourselves. Because we have one gal who's very creative and another gal who doesn't like conflict. And the two of them just are having a really hard time communicating with each other. Sure. Because they don't know their behaviors. One says, well, this is how I am. You have to you have to deal with it. it. And the other one says, well, what about me? Yeah. What, what about, about my, my behaviors? <laughs> behaviors? <laughs> what about me? So it was, it was really interesting. And I really mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 And that's why I took it home, too, because it, you know it's in the workplace and, and then it's at home. And by the way, you can have the same parents and six kids and they've all got a different PI. Mm -hmm. I had a mom who, her son, she was outgoing and friendly, son, Mr. Talkative, 
And she had a daughter who was extraordinarily private and quiet and shy. And the mother had actually developed the opinion that the kid was sneaky, not part of the family. And she resented, there was a big wall up between them. She picked her up from school. How was school? Fine. She'd come home, go in her room, and shut the door. And by the way, those private people don't shut you out. They shut themselves in. That's where they're comfortable. That's where they think. And those type of people need time to think. They need to organize their thoughts before they speak. So change their relationship. 